Howdy folks, Film Brown here, Tumbleweed Theater. Got a film tonight that, uh, uh, the pedigree of this film is as rich as any great stew that you could ever make, rich as any great Texas chili that you could ever brew together. And let's talk a little bit about a film called The Young Land, 1959. This film deals with the sort of the collision of cultures which makes this kind of a kind of a progressive film in some ways the way it handles its issues I don't want to go into that too deeply let you unpack that a little bit yourself but it deals in that time period when uh, well California has be recently become a sort of a state of the United States and there's that struggle between those gringos and those Mexicans and a crime occurs where a, uh, a white man a gringo kills a Mexican and there's a trial and what that trial does is put on to trial the whole justice system and the sort of the, the issues that Mexicans are afraid of when America takes over or when the United States takes over California as a state and vice versa. Now, the film has some great people working on it. Some wonderful people. The film is directed by Ted Tetzlaff. Now, Tetzlaff was known primarily as a photographer, as a cinematographer. He did the cinematography on uh, Talk of the Town and on Hitchcock's Notorious, which was really the last film that he did cinematography on. And then he moved into directing, and The Young Land is one of those films that he, he puts his mind to working with. The film is written by John Reese and Norman S. Hall. Uh, John Reese wrote Charlie Barrett later on. One of those great Walter Matthau uh, caper films. You don't think of Walter Matthau too often playing sort of a hard-bitten guy, but uh, that's one of those cases. That's one of those Don Siegel-directed films. Now, Hall himself, uh, during an earlier incarnation, worked in a lot of westerns, worked for Gene Autry, writing some scripts, uh, wrote a lot of scripts for the Buck Rogers and the Flash Gordon uh, series as well. Some other folks behind the scenes. We're not even talking cast yet about this film. Uh, for instance, the producers of this film, three individuals, Lowell Farrell, Patrick Ford, and C.V. Whitney. Now, in a way, one of the ways to think about this film is it's uh, sort of, uh, I would like to maybe think of it, son of John Ford, to a certain extent. Because you're going to, as we talk about the personnel at this point, we're going to see a lot of people who sort of worked with John Ford and his cadre of folks, and now they're off trying to make their own little movie here, The Young Land. Now, Lowell Farrell, he himself uh, was an assistant director to John Ford on films like Stagecoach and Ford Apache. Patrick Ford, well, that's John Ford's son. And uh, there that pedigree and that connection to the Ford tradition fits in quite well. C.V. Whitney himself worked on The Searchers as a, uh, uh, as a key piece of uh, personnel. So there's a lot of connection here with the John Ford stuff. We also can continue that John Ford discussion when we look at the cinematographers. For instance, Winton Hawk. Winton Hawk, okay, uh, you might remember him for uh, a series of key films. He worked on things like uh, uh, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon and Sergeants 3 and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Robinson Crusoe on Mars. So that connection there uh, is quite, uh, quite apparent. Now the Ford connection is there as well. Searchers, worked on The Quiet Man, Three Godfathers, and was a consultant uh, for color uh, for the uh, Gone with the Wind. So that wasn't a Ford film in and of itself, but you can see he's working all over the place. Henry Sharp also uh, worked on a number of key films. Uh, he is another of the cinematographers in this film, and uh, he did things like uh, Duck Soup, It's a Gift, Dr. Cyclops, which is an interesting connection. Dr. Cyclops was worked on by both Winton Hawk and by Henry Sharp. So there is sort of like uh, two folks who have worked together before on a film have come together. And the color in this film, this is a, uh, The Young Land, it's a nice technicolor film. And uh, maybe that, that pays off. We know that, for instance, uh, Hawk was a uh, sort of a, co a color consultant, a technicolor consultant for Gone with the Wind. And we know that Dr. Cyclops was one of those great uh, color science fiction uh, film. So there's a lot of uh, traipsing across a uh, variety of uh, folks working together. The film's music was written by Dmitry Tiomkin. 
Now you might remember him for writing the, uh, the gunfight, okay, corral, and uh, the thing, and the gunfighter, uh, and a number of other films. He wrote the music for uh, uh, the song that was used throughout, for instance, Red River as well, which will be used later in Rio Bravo. Uh, what is that? My Rifle, My Pony, and Me. What a great song that is. Uh, think it on. The film was edited by, well, Tom McAdoo. Muckadoo, what a great name, Muckadoo. Muckadoo about nothing? Well, Muckadoo about Shane. He, uh, he edited Shane. He also uh, edited that great Danny Kaye uh, musical comedy, Court Jester. Now that brings us to the cast, and uh, I really want to unpack the cast. Uh, there are some key people in this film uh, that you might know of and heard of before. I think the real star in this film is Dennis Hopper. Okay, now this is pre-Easy uh, Rider, of course, by quite a few years, and he's just coming out of Rebel Without a Cause just a few years earlier than this, and you know that he appears in a number of different westerns at this time, and on, you know, Sons of Katie Elder, etc., and uh, he always plays this despicable bad guy, uh, and of course that's what Dennis Hopper made his career on, was making uh, these uh, bad men uh, so hateable that you just wanted to crawl up on the screen and just uh, kind of tear them apart. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Blue Velvet, much further down the line, uh, the David Lynch film, uh, really puts on display uh, the, uh, what, the, 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 the angry, ugly Dennis Hopper character. What a great character. Now, he's the man who murders a Mexican and is the one I put on trial. And you, you love to hate him. Even his friends love to seem to hate him in this film as the film progresses. I won't go too far into that. Another key guy in here, Ken Curtis. He plays uh, a guy who's deputized at a certain point, but he's a friend of the, uh, uh, the uh, Dennis Hopper character, Hatfield Carnes. They call him Hat. Okay. But Ken Curtis, he plays Lee Hearn. Watch him. Now, remember, he, he's a key guy in the, uh, the, the John Ford world, uh, right? Uh, you know him in The Searchers. You know him in uh, a series of key westerns and uh, non-westerns, too, that John Ford puts together at the same time period and so on. Likewise, Ken Curtis, of course, is Festus later on in, uh, in Gunsmoke and so on. Another guy in here I always like is Pedro Gonzalez Gonzalez. He plays uh, a deputy. He's kind of a funny guy in this film. He usually plays a little squirt of a guy. And uh, he, he, he plays a guy who continuously is listening at the door of the jury all the time. It's like, oh, you know, uh, what are they doing and everything? And, you know, and they, they kind of sneak up on him and say, hey, are you listening? He goes, oh, I'm not listening. And he goes, what's going on? And he goes, I'm hung they're hungry and things. I've got to feed them and so on. And they don't seem to feed this Pedro too much. He's always hungry all the time. Another key figure in here is Dan O'Herlihy. Dan O'Herlihy. You might have known him as, in Bunnell's Robinson Crusoe. The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. Likewise, I just saw a film, 100 Rifles, that he's in as well. Uh, so he, he, he makes his appearance in here. He plays this august judge, Judge Millard Isham. And uh, he's sort of the, the voice of uh, the law. Kind of, kind of a cool guy in here. Uh, and he, he sort of, uh, he mistrusts. And this brings us to another of the key figures, Sheriff Jim Elson, Ellison. Sheriff Jim Ellison is played by none other than Patrick Wayne. Now, of course, that's John Wayne's son. And, of course, that Ford connection is forged again. And i got to say something here, and you might not like hearing this, but I think that uh, you, you'll kind of concur uh, when you, you're finished, or as it doesn't take long to concur, perhaps, what I'm going to say, is that Patrick Wayne cannot act his way out of a paper bag. Woof! Horrible. Man, he is as wooden as all get out. I mean, there is no sense of energy, no sense of, uh, like, he understands his lines. Uh, he's like, yep, man, no, man. I mean, he, he actually uh, can't act any better than a lot of those bad B or sub B uh, serial cowboys that we saw in the 30s and so on. His dad, even in his worst moments, was a much better actor than Patrick Wayne. This is a starring role for Patrick Wayne. Well, you know Patrick Wayne pops up in a number of sort of side roles, things like he's in Searchers, uh, he's in McClintock and stuff like that, but he's never a main character. Here, he has to hold up the film. Whoa. Now, I'm not sure, and I would have to think that Patrick Ford and all these guys and uh, Tetzloff knew what they were working with there. 
and were kind of struggling with it. They know good acting from bad acting, and they saw some bad acting there. One of the things that you will see, and a lot of people criticize this film for this, but I think uh, it's a bit of a strategy here to some extent, and also ties into the Ford tradition as well, is that there's very few, if any, close-ups in this film. Everything is uh, medium shot to long shot, extreme long shot. And you think, whoa, you got all these great camera guys. You got three camera guys on this film, right? Really, the director, ex-cameraman, and two cameramen. You think, oh, they, they'd sneak in some uh, close-ups and things. No, nah, no, nah, not necessarily. For one, if you look at the great forward films, he's not a believer in close-ups. He's more of a man who likes the long shot, right? Uh, and doesn't give you a lot of uh, coverage. Now, one of the reasons why John Ford didn't do that, as some people might argue, is that early on in his career, uh, he recognized two things. He loved shooting a film, but he didn't like really having to do with the editing much of it. So, you know, you'd shoot a film, you'd give it to the editor, and the editor would monkey with it. You'd come back and say, gosh, that's not exactly what I had in mind. And he didn't like that monkeying around business. So what do you do? To minimize that, don't give him any coverage. Don't give them a lot of uh, over-the-shoulder shots. Don't give them a lot of close-ups and give them a lot of uh, reaction shots and things like that. Shoot long. Maybe a few medium shots and so on, but if you, the less that you give your editor, the less that they have a chance to monkey with your image, monkey with your vision. And, of course, John Ford, uh, when he was done shooting a film, what did he want to do? Jump on his yacht and go boating with John Wayne and Ward Bond and folks like that and get drunk. Okay. Uh, if you read much about the uh, the John Ford character and all them bunch of guys, they're uh, you know very heavily into uh, into the uh, Shinola. Okay, uh, but going back to this issue, no coverage, things like that. Now, when you think about uh, also, you got a bad actor. Well, keep them in long shot. Keep them in uh, oh some medium shots and things like that, but minimize the amount of time that you have to get close on the fellow. So if you have to do perhaps any kind of uh, ADR, any uh, uh, dubbing of voices and things like that, you can do that without any problems. But I, I, one, I like long takes myself, and I like the idea of long shots and extreme long shots, particularly for a Western. Even for a Western that has the potential to get logged down and bogged down in uh, the jury and in the trial. There are many films, obviously, uh, 12 Angry Men and so on, they get very claustrophobic because they deal with the, the trial and the, uh, the give and take of uh, the two sides and the jury getting together and uh, uh, arguing cases out and things like that. This film doesn't allow itself to get bogged down. I mean, it has a number of different locations, not just the, 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 the courtroom, but also we have some good saloons work and we have some uh, good work in the jail and so on. Some nice, nice stuff. Uh, Patrick Wayne, yeah, bad actor. Now, one of the things about him as well, though, he's sort of a, des a destry rides again type of guy, too, because he really doesn't want to use a gun. You know, he, he wants to talk his way out of it, which is kind of, a, uh, kind of a struggle and a challenge for this guy right now. Jimmy Stewart, right, uh, as Destry, great actor, had the ability to deliver lines so that he could, like, diffuse issues and things like that without using a gun. Well, you got Patrick Wayne, who's supposed to be sort of doing the same kind of thing, but he just kind of stumbles through, and uh, uh, he needs a gun. Uh, give him a gun, and I think he'll be okay. Uh, uh, he, he'll do better at it. Think you're going to enjoy this film, The Young Land, 1959? I hope I kind of set it up for you, interestingly. I mean, it's got the social issues, it's got the trial issues, and it's got the real struggles of a Patrick Wayne trying to hold up a film. Likewise, a number of personnel trying to hold him up. Trying to, trying to kind of buoy him up. Because one, hey, I don't know, did John Wayne himself, did the, the big duke, did he, did he uh, grace the set with his presence, man? Okay, walk on the set, that's my boy, you know, take care of him. You know, if he stumbles, you stumble. If he falls, you're going to fall. Take care of my boy. Well, you know, we try to take care of the Westerns for you. Try to bring you the best in fair and the young land I think you're going to have a lot of fun with. Some people say it's not that necessarily of a good film. I like the film a lot. Matter of fact, I, you know, even with Patrick Wayne, I'm sort of an aficionado of uh, bad acting. I like bad acting to a certain extent, and there are certain now, now. One, he's not as bad an actor that makes him great. That's one of the problems. Uh, he's not a Tim Farrell as you find in the Ed Wood films. He's so bad, he's great. Okay, here, me, nah, uh, Patrick Wayne is so bad, he's just bad. Roll him, Smokey.